Welcome along. My name is Dr Alan Wood. I'm a senior lecturer in the physics team at Nottingham Trent University and welcome along to the first of these short videos on space weather and the Northern Lights. Now these videos are targeted at year 12 and year 13 physics students and the idea is just to do some really really great physics especially while the UK is on lockdown. So these videos are released on Tuesdays and Thursdays each week. They last about 10 minutes and they take you through some really interesting physics and then what they also do is they set a few questions for you to have a think about and you to read up on and try out a few things in between the videos. So I hope you enjoy. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen and then what we're going to do is we're going to pick up the PowerPoint that we're going to be using today. So we'll just hop in here and then once uh, I get back to the beginning, then we can hit uh, for, then we can hit start. Okay, so this first video is about In Search of the Northern Lights and we're going to start off just with some really, really, really beautiful images of the Northern Lights. And the Northern Lights have fascinated people for absolutely millennia. These bands of green and red and purple hanging in the night sky, they're one of the most beautiful of all natural phenomena. And if you're lucky enough to see them yourselves, sometimes you see them like this, like curtains across the sky. Sometimes the whole sky is blazing in colour. Sometimes they're mostly green, sometimes a variety of colours. This photo here is taken in Iceland by one of our students, Henry. So let's just begin with a few historical observations of the Northern Lights. Now, the earliest observation we've got, which we think might be the Northern Lights, is from 30,000 BC, cave paintings in France. Now these paintings, they're a little bit difficult to interpret because it's a little bit difficult to see what's going on in some cave paintings. Um, and it's a little bit difficult to establish exactly when they were uh, painted. But we think there's a cave painting from about 30,000 BC that seems to show the Northern Lights in France. From about 2600 BC, there's a description in some Chinese writings which may well be the Northern Lights. In terms of how uh, these phenomena describe these sort of fiery dragons in the sky, it could be a comet, it could even be a supernova. But it seems more like the Northern Lights than anything else. The descriptions of some of the ancient Chinese writings were more artistic than scientific, so they're really beautiful but sometimes it can be a bit difficult to work out exactly what phenomena they represent. If we go back to 450 BC, we're pretty sure that there's observations from ancient Greece. Now, the, ancient, uh, the records of the ancient Greeks of uh, observations of objects in the sky, these were written in more of a scientific style, so they're not necessarily as beautiful as some of the Chinese writings, but they're easier to extract the scientific information. And so we're very, and so that gives us great confidence that these observations from Greece from 450 BC are the Northern Lights. Now we've got observations here from France, from China, from Greece. These are not places we typically think of as seeing the Northern Lights or the Aurora Borealis today. And we're going to come back to why that might be a bit later on. If we get to 1230 AD, then the King's Mirror, a text published in Norway, gives some lovely descriptions of the Northern Lights and starts to give some ideas about what might cause them. Now, the King's Mirror, it was an absolutely fascinating text. The King's Mirror is a book in two parts. One part of it is about how one should behave when one goes to the King's Court, which is of great interest to historians. And the other half was about the best scientific ideas around the world at the time. And here is a translation talking about the Northern Lights, giving a description of them. It's saying these Northern Lights have this peculiar nature. The darker the night is, the brighter they seem. They always appear at night, but never by day, most frequently in the densest darkness and rarely by moonlight. In appearance, they resemble a vast flame of fire viewed from a great distance. It also looks as if sharp points were shot from this flame up into the sky. These are of an even height and are in constant motion. Now one, now another darting highest, and the light appears to blaze like a living flame. While these rays are the highest and brightest, they give forth so much light that people out of doors can easily find their way about and can even go hunting if need be. And the description goes on further. And if you want to read that in detail, have a look at this link here. And it's an absolutely fascinating read. But you see this wonderful description about when the Northern Lights appear to, uh, appear to arise and what sort of things they look like and how they change. And we will come back to that 
in due course. We'll come back to that in a following session. Now, the King's Mirror also started to go into explanations of what might cause the Northern Lights. And there were three ideas put forward. And one idea was saying, well, you've got the Earth, and then at the edge of the Earth, you've got water, and maybe you've got fire out beyond the water, and maybe the fire breaks through and sometimes causes the Northern Lights. But the author of the King's Mirror did say they didn't think that was terribly likely. Another idea is they said, well, as everybody knows, the world's not flat, it's sort of a disc shape. And the sun goes over the disc at the daytime and under the disc at nighttime. And maybe the sun's rays can sometimes come up through the cracks at the edge of a disc, cracks at the edge of the world and cause the Northern Lights. And another suggestion was, well, maybe, well, this, the gla uh, glaciers occurred at places where the Northern Lights were seen. So maybe glaciers were radiating power and were causing the Northern Lights. Of course, we now know none of those explanations is quite correct. The ultimate source of the Northern Lights is the sun. If you were to look at the sun in visible light, it'd be a really silly thing to do because you get serious and permanent eye damage. However, if you look at the sun with appropriate filters at different wavelengths, you start to see loads of different structures. So we start seeing the sun as a very changeable dynamic object. It changes not just with wavelength, but over time as well. So if we look at this nice little movie here from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, then what you can see here is you can see some of these structures on the sun changing over time. And if you follow these structures around here, something called a coronal loop, where the magnetic field of the sun is becoming twisted and reaching up through the surface of the sun, you can see those changing over time. Now, from our point of view at the Earth, we're going to see changes for two reasons. One reason is because the sun itself is changing, and the other because the structures facing us are changing as the sun rotates. So let's just see that movie one more time, because it is really, really nice. So, and that movie's from the Solar Dynamics Observatory team. So let's have a look now at the solar wind. So we've seen the sun is dynamic in space and in time. Now let's look at the solar wind. And to do that, we're going to use this movie from a space mission called LASCO. And what we've got here is we're looking at the sun and seeing the solar wind flowing out. And the first thing you can see is there's loads and loads and loads of changes. So in this movie, what we've got is we've got the sun behind this disc. This little circle tells us the position of the sun and the disk is blocking out the sun and the region of space immediately around it. And that means we're able to see the solar wind. And so we can see the solar wind flowing out from the sun and we can see it being very, very variable. Sometimes we get big explosions, sometimes not. Sometimes we get streams like this one up here, sometimes not. And we all, there's another nice big explosion there. Sometimes we get all these little white dots like this. What are those white dots? Well, those are very high energy particles traveling out from the sun at an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. So we see the sun as a very dynamic, changeable object. Now, there's a couple of things on this movie that stand out as a little bit odd. The first of them is this object over here that looks a little bit like a flying saucer. It is not a flying saucer, it is for planet Mercury. Now in terms of how the CCD operates here, it means if one pixel saturates, some of that information appears on neighbouring pixels. And so because the planet Mercury is so bright in this movie, some of its information appears on neighbouring pixels. So this shows how important it is to make sure you know how your instrument works. The other thing is this region here where it looks like we've got absolutely nothing flowing out from the sun. There's nothing physically significant about this. What it is, is it's the stick holding this disc in place over here. So the key thing is we can see that the sun is variable in space and in time. We can see the solar wind is variable in space and in time. We can see all these structures hurtling out from the sun into interplanetary space. Now, what do these structures do? Well, they can have a substantial effect upon uh, bodies within the solar system. So let's just have a look at this nice little movie from a mission called Stereo. So you can see here the sun is to, uh, off, to, off from the right-hand side of the image, and we can see the solar wind flowing out against the background star field. And you can see a comet here as well. And it's a really beautiful movie because you can see the solar wind, you can see the comet, you can see the star field. It's really great. But it's not necessarily the best movie for doing science from, because it's difficult to work out what to do with the star field and what is to do with the uh, solar wind. So 
what we've got here is we've got an image from something called a difference movie. And in the difference movie, what we're doing is we're looking at the difference between one frame and another. And in the difference movie, light grey means no changes from one frame to the next. White or black regions means we've got changes. And if you are standing at a point in space, I know that's not really possible, but just imagine you were. If you're standing at a point in space, well, if you're in a white region here, then it means the density of the solar wind flowing past you is increasing. If you're in a black region, it means the density of the solar wind flowing past you is decreasing. So let's just have a little look at this movie. So we can see these solar wind structures flowing out from the sun. And have a look at the comet over here. Watch what happens as these structures go past the sun, uh, go past the comet, sorry. Do you see these solar wind structures ripping the tail of the comet? Let's see if we can see that one more time. So the solar wind has a substantial effect upon the comet. So what have we seen? We've seen that the sun is variable in space and in time. We've seen the solar wind is variable in space and in time. We've seen that the solar wind has a substantial effect upon that comet. We think the solar wind has also had a substantial effect upon Venus. We think that over the course of the history of the solar system, it's removed water from Venus. And we'll talk about that in a few weeks time. So it's hardly surprising that the solar wind will have a substantial effect upon the Earth. So let's have a look at this little movie from NASA's scientific visualisation suites. Here we've got the sun and we've got the solar wind flowing out from the sun into interplanetary space. It's a little bit tenuous, but it's still just about visible there on the screen. Here comes the Earth with its magnetic field. And the magnetic field of the Earth deflects most of the material from the solar wind. But the shielding is not complete. Some of this material gets trapped, it hurtles in towards the upper atmosphere, and it crashes into the upper atmosphere with two processes going on ionization and excitation. The process of ionization forms a plasma, and we'll talk about that in subsequent weeks. The process of excitation forms the northern lights. Now, the guy who worked this all out was a guy called Christian Berkeland, and here he is with his experimental equipment in his lab. And so what he did was he got a sphere to represent the Earth. He put a magnet inside it to represent the magnetic field of the Earth. He put a tenuous gas around it to represent the atmosphere of the Earth, and he fired charged particles at it, just like the solar wind. And he created artificial aurora in the lab. And here we see his experiment, creating artificial aurora, artificial northern lights, working out how this whole process works. His achievements were, uh, were celebrated on the old uh, 200 kroner banknote in Norway, unfortunately no longer used. And we can see him there. And there is his experimental equipment. If we look on the other side of the banknotes, what do we see? Well, over here, we see the auroral oval. We see the location where the northern lights is most commonly seen. And over here, we see currents named after this great scientist here, the Birkeland currents, that make this whole system work. So we said we have material hurtling in from space and crashing into the upper atmosphere, and that it causes two, two things go on, ionization and excitation. Ionization creates a plasma that we'll talk about in future weeks. Excitation leads to the northern lights. So suppose what we've got here is we've got an oxygen atom. Here we've got an oxygen atom, an atom and I've just drawn one electron, the outermost electron. And you can see from an illustration like this why my wife illustrates children's books and I do not. So there we go. So there we've got our oxygen atom with just one electron shown here, the outermost electron. So we've got material hurtles in from space, hits into something like this oxygen atom, and the electron can move up to an excited state. And I've also drawn that on an energy level diagram over towards the left of the slide. So I've just for reference, I've said that zero electron volts is going to be that ground state. And now we've gone up to an excited state. Now, after some amount of time, the electron drops back towards the ground state. And this leads to a couple of questions I want to pose at the end of this video. What colour is the aurora? Now, we know what colour the aurora is, what colour the northern lights is. We know that we see things like greens and reds and stuff like that. But how can you work it out from an energy level diagram like this? You might want the diagram. You might also want to consider this equation here. E energy equals H Planck's constant multiplied by C 
the speed of light in free space divided by wavelength. You might also want to consider the sensitivity of the human eye. So some calculations to do there, and there's some reading to do, to do with the sensitivity of the human eye. And see if you can work out from that what color is the aurora, and also what colors are most commonly seen and why. Okay, so that's where we're going to finish for today. Thank you very much for your attention. The next video will be uploaded on Thursday, and I hope very much to see you then.